Hello, welcome to Level 5 Health and Social Care, Unit 502 Quality. And we're looking at week four, the last week of our unit. Um, and we're addressing just one criteria where we're evaluating strategies to improve safety. And we're also, um, I'm going to talk you through the assignment as well. Okay. So there's just one objective, really, which is the last part of task three. But when you write up on this, make sure that you write up on it as, as task three, not alone. OK, and it's evaluate strategies that can be used to improve service users safety. So I'm just going to address a few um, strategies that are being used at the moment, um, particularly across the NHS and um, you can do a little evaluation of them and some of these I think mean, you're gonna have to use your common sense for you know think about what the strengths and weaknesses could be about that and I've also added a resource which is the NHS safety strategy which is quite large and quite detailed so you you can sort of pick up a lot of ideas from that as well So what's the issue? I mean, patient safety is a really key component in all the work you do. It's important to prevent patient harm um, and to ensure that health outcomes are good and reduce, you know, wasted costs as well. And without um, having some sort of strategy for people's safety, adverse events can lead to you having receiving the wrong care. And according to the World Health Organization, one in 10 patients is harmed while receiving healthcare services, which is, you know, a bit of a shock, really, isn't it? Um, and so fortunately, a lot of these adverse events are preventable. So let's have a look at some safety improvement strategies that can help with that. So I've got five strategies here um, that really cover quite a lot of areas where adverse uh, harm has happened okay so we've got nurture a patient safety culture so, so it's about having the culture of the organization we're going to we're going to look at each one of these in a little bit more depth in a minute uh, identify and work on mistakes reduce chances of human error ensure a clean hospital environment and ensure accurate patient identification now, these are five strategies. They are not the only strategies. There are and lots of organisations have created other strategies, but a lot of them have covered at least one or two or three of these. OK, so I've picked out ones that I think work for um, care homes, clinics, hospitals, cover, you know, quite a lot of different areas, really, um, GPs. So I thought I'd use these as they're quite, quite big strategies. But again, if you look at the resource that I've given you, the NHS has a lot of strategies. So if you want to pick some others out of that, you can do. But remember to cite and reference correctly. OK, let's have a look at a patient safety culture. What do we mean by that? Um, it's 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 about creating a culture that where people work together to constantly improve care. So, you know, thinking back to our quality improvement sort of uh, approach in week one. So it means that all employees, part of the team from the, the cleaners um, to the managers, to the care providers, to the people who work in the kitchens, are all part of that culture um, and they focus on people's safety and the quality of their care more than anything else. And the, the work is more patient-centred or person-centred. So, in fact, those providers that don't have such a person-centred culture tend to struggle with adverse events and errors. For for instance, if a doctor comes to visit, they need to focus on the person themselves rather than just writing up their medical records 
and they need to involve them in the decision making process. And if people are more involved, actually, you can often avoid um, some of these problems that may come around. So if you have a really good insight into the person, what their ailments are, what, what's wrong with them, what you what are you working with them, and that's about reading care plans, being aware, then there's less chance of making a mistake. And that leads us on to identifying mistakes. So rather than just acknowledging, you know, a, a mistakes do happen. So maybe someone gives the wrong medication in that case. Instead of just sort of saying, OK, this has happened, um, it's the team should start thinking about, OK, is there a chance of this happening again? What was the cause of it? Um, can we change? Is there a process we need to change that that can stop it happening again? So this is again, it's part of that having that quality improvement culture. Um, so think what can we do in the future to change it? So after um, one of the experiences I've had is whenever there's a mistake that's fairly serious and like giving the wrong medication, for example, is quite serious. Um, you might have a quick debrief at your next team meeting about what happened there. What can we do? Do we need to change the way we document things? Do we need to change the, the medication giving out process? Um, had someone put the wrong thing in the wrong place? So was it just one of those things? And is there anything we can do by like doing double checks? What came around was usually is that medication is given as a double check. So one person seeing it and one person seeing what you're doing, but saying I'm giving this to Mrs. Bloggs and, and that sort of thing. And there were sort of processes that came around. So there can be different solutions um, and they can you know, you might be able to work out different things, but do it as a whole team and find out how you can prevent it. Reduce the chance for human error. As I've said, technology is evolving rapidly, but some healthcare providers are quite stuck with old processes and manual methods and lots of sort of things written down on paper and stuck into ring binders. And that does leave a lot of room for human error and that can jeopardise people's safety. Um, again, going back to something like medicine administration, if people can't read the handwriting of the person who prescribed it, you know, <coughs> excuse me, you know, there's a problem that, that could lead to a problem. So it's about, you know, taking the point to write with clarity. Um, if you think back to some of the things we did on, you know, going back a long way and I think to level three, when we did stuff on recording, making sure that you use the same way of recording everywhere and that the whole team is taught to do it properly. Encouraging, you know, if the organisation can afford it, using digital systems tend to help. Um, some care homes also use um a system where all the medication is made up for the individual into blister bubbles and the all you need to do is to check the name of the person and you're not even actually measuring it out anymore because a pharmacist has done it elsewhere so th those those are possible options that you could look into um if you've got a digital solution if someone's notes and prescription thing it all comes out nicely printed then um, there's a chance that you have less error, especially if people have got similar names that are spelt slightly differently. Notes with a photograph on is really, really helpful as well. So you can actually think about something like that. That's just a simple example. But looking at all your processes every now and then and, and finding out if there's a way that you can improve them to make them more foolproof is, is quite important. Human error will always exist. You will never eradicate it completely. But if you can do an awful lot to avoid it or avoid the chance of it happening, it's quite good. Ensuring a clean environment. Now, some of us would say this is obvious. And yes, it is. 
but it is a strategy that needs to be considered. Um, you need to provide a safe environment, uh, free from contamination, free from cross infection, and that's all about processes. Hospital acquired infections, the numbers can be really high. Hospital wards, you would think, should be the cleanest places going, but if they are not, they can have a negative issue. So there needs to be fair cleaning rotations and there needs to be documented cleaning processes. When, when a patient leaves a hospital bed, there needs to be um, a clear process in how the bed is cleaned, when it's stripped, how long it's left, um, what do you clean it with, what products do you use, those sorts of things. Um, Lots and lots of health and safety policies are important. How to use the hoists. Those of you who work with uh, service users who need a hoist to get in and out the bath, on and off the loo, um, you need to have very clear processes about how they use. People need to be trained to use them as well, because if you use them badly, you can injure yourself or you can injure the service user. That's the sort of an additional thing to do with a clean environment. But the appropriate use of PPE, what sort of PPE you use in what some circumstances should also be a documented policy. Hand washing. Hand washing, there should be training. And again, a policy so that people are clear what the process is. Now, this was pushed a lot more in COVID time, which is quite good, really because I do think some people have forgotten how to do it properly. So some of us have learnt now about sort of scrubbing, scrubbing and time factors as well. Using sterile dressings, that seems a bit obvious for those of you working in care, but to make sure that your dressings, your sterile dressings aren't out of date, check the date before you use them because they're sterilised and then sometimes in time they might lose a bit of that sterility. And aseptic techniques, when you are actually dressing someone's wound, there is a technique to do it. And that should be clearly documented so that people know how to do it properly. And you need good training on that because you can actually introduce dirt into the wound instead of taking it away if you don't do it properly. And all of this leads towards reducing hospital acquired infections. Um, there's lots of stuff about cross-contamination using your gloves on one person's infective wound not and if you don't change your gloves between patients then you're carrying that infection to the other patient that may seem obvious but people forget it when they're busy so again you need policies around that as well and you also need to do um, some observation now and then to make sure that those policies are being upheld and that's for supervisors team leaders managers to be doing a walk around and observation, observing aseptic technique, observing people doing a wound dressing. You don't have to be, you know, frightening subtly, but there needs to be some processes in place for that. Patient identification, bit of an issue, really. Um, it was a number one goal for the Joint Commission for 2022, really, because, yeah. You know, in, especially in hospitals, there's been mix-ups. Um, you can click on that and you can find out a bit more about it. The problem is, is that patient misidentification can lead to a lot of issues. And it can end up with one person having two sets of records um, or you could end up having the wrong treatment you could end up with even medical identity theft and you think why on earth would someone want to do that well if they if they're not entitled to treatment in this country or in your country um because because of their status their citizenship status and they might have to pay more for treatment like they certainly would in in the uk then it's possible that people will try to take the identity of someone they know who maybe looks a bit like them that that is entitled to treatment and all of this can lead to adverse healthcare outcomes 
and 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 a mix up of the patient giving the wrong treatment can also often mean they may be readmitted to hospital because they might get iller than they was before because you've given them the wrong stuff and you can even kill someone so um there's lots of ways to think about you know we're used to arm bands but we have to be careful that they don't get smudged or we have to be careful um they don't um you know that they're, they're written clearly again um another example is bringing in software that locks the medical records while during the registration program to a particular photograph and once the photograph is done i mean this is right patient um some people are using this once someone's been registered once you only have to look at a camera when they revisit the hospital and they'll have to be matched against their original photograph um, so that's an idea but um, other other e electronic ways of sort of registering people even electronic um, references alone can be helpful because um, even if you can't afford this very expensive software you can always put someone's picture on their you know in their file as well which is just you know doesn't have to be that clever really but pictures to go with names is quite is an important strategy yeah and lots of care homes have actually been doing it for quite a long time it also helps when people go missing as well um, when you're trying trying to get someone to look for someone um, you know if you've got a photograph of them in their folders with all their names and the places where they go home to it can be really really helpful so patient identification as well and again if someone's new in your care home it may be not the best thing to do to let them do the first medication round when they don't know the service users or they should at least go around with someone who does know the service users but you should be still checking people's medication against their wristbands or against their photos you know so you need some written processes about that as well so those these are just some ideas of uh strategies and you can evaluate these find out the strengths and weaknesses of some of them or where things can go wrong where they they could work have a look at the big nhs safety strategy i've put into your resources and you can pick anything out of there you might want to write about i mean if you think there's a weakness in some of the ideas they've come up with um that's fine please you know say so as part of your evaluation because i'm interested to see you you know thinking and analyzing by yourself as well so that safety strategy will give you plenty enough ones that you can use okay so just have a look at that um you can do some google research if you can find somebody else's strategies make sure it's a sort of uh, respected organization though i mean there might be some strategies that you come across in in your home country um, that are useful or that they might be very specific to your home country for a specific issue I and mean, that'll be fine that'll be interesting for this one you can use your home country stuff okay that's all there is really on evaluating strategies um, it really just focus on a strategy that's about service users safety okay not so much about the organizations but it's 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 not just about quality um here it's just about safety so keep it keep it focused and down to the word count okay okay let's look at the assignment now Task one. Now, remember, just a reminder that now we're writing assignments more like essays. We are not using each criteria as a heading. The only headings I want to see in your document are task one, task two, task three. Underneath that, you write a paragraph that answers the criteria, but I don't want you to highlight the criteria. I will find it in your work. At a level five, you need to be writing academic essay style. And that is where the marker finds the points. You don't headline them, okay? So I want you 
to write a nice paragraph that flows well, where you maybe move from one topic to another. That shows your academic writing. OK, so please do that. Any questions, you know where to find me on, on the WhatsApp. So um, please do that. I've highlighted the command verbs here to think about what you're actually doing. So we're going back to week one here. All of task one is contained in week one. And we're going to critically discuss the role of quality assurance. So that's QA. OK, just focus on that. And then 1.2 is critically discuss two models for ensuring quality improvement. So you're focusing on QI here. OK, you can in your role of quality assurance, because you're critically discussing it, you can actually say, if you remember, I gave you um, Q, QA versus QI. And you can say why QA isn't really, you know, as good as QI, because it's not about ongoing improvement. OK, so you've got 600 words to split these two up, 300 words each if you want, or two and four. If you want to write more on the models, it's up to you, really. OK, the two models I gave you was um, plan, plan, do, act, forgot the name, forgot it now, um, and lean. You can use those two models if you wish. You could also um, use Six Sigma. All of those three are used regularly in the NHS. So that's not a problem. You can also use a model I haven't discussed with you, as long as you've researched it well. And that you don't forget to cite and reference properly. That goes with all of it, really. And you need to find one that that shows it's been used in the in in health and social care. It doesn't have to be the NHS. It can be health and social care in any way. Okay. I don't want you to just give me industry ones because I want you to maybe use a little example. I gave you an example of, you know, improving cancer treatments. I just want you to come up with some sort of example. Um, and it's got to be healthcare based. OK, those three are used regularly um, in healthcare. So the two that I, I've done it in the slides and Six Sigma, OK, would be fine. Anything more than that, just make sure that it's got an extensive use in healthcare. If it's used in your country and maybe not in mine, that's fine, as long as it is being used somewhere. OK, any questions on task one? You can contact me, but it's critically discussed. So I want you to explain it and then have a little bit of, you know, a little bit of criticism on it, you know, a little bit of um, strengths and weaknesses, maybe, or, you know, pros and cons, you know. OK, remember that one of the weaknesses of lean is it focuses on waste. OK, and that can be detrimental to other things, but I want you to think on that. I did give you some ideas in the video. OK, task two, which is all focused on what we looked at in the slides for week two. Um, again, the same sort of thing, just a task to head in and then a paragraph. Don't highlight the criteria. I will find them. So you're, you've got to analyse both of these. So, you know, a little bit more detail than just a discussion, not just a description. But, you know, again, the pros and cons, strengths and weaknesses, just push that up a little bit. And for the role of the CQC, it's got to be a critical analysis. And we know there is there is a few critiques of CQC. I have given you information that you could use. You can probably Google some more as well if you need. Again, don't forget site reference. Um, 
And the other thing is analyze the roller benchmark. So 2.1, the role. So what do they do? What are they supposed to do? And is there any criticism about the way they do it? Or the way, does it work? There's quite a few people who think CQC has got to, should be totally remodeled. So you can have a look at that as well. You should see that in your um, the resources I've given you. Also, the role of benchmarking. So benchmarking, as I said, very popular in the NHS, might not be so popular in your care services, but it's very popular in hospitals and that. Um, what is the role of it? What does it achieve? OK, can it do it well? Are there any problems with it? OK, task three, um, the first two criteria I looked at in week three, you'll find all that in the week three video. And the last one we've just looked at now. OK, you've got 800 words. You can split it up as you wish. Um, so there's obviously one of them that's going to need a bit less. I would say spend um, a bit more time. 3.1 and 3.3 you'll probably write more on. 3.2 is just identify who the stakeholders are. I gave you a chart. You just need to write it out. So it won't need as much words as 3.1 and 3.3 will. OK, so that's a bit of guidance um 3.1 evaluate the methods i want you to tell me about the methods um you give me an example of about three or four different types of methods three or four is probably enough and maybe some strengths and weaknesses on them so surveys questionnaires you might want to say a little bit about the difference between qualitative and quantitative research as an intro to that bit uh, and then under that, you might want to give me a little example. Give me at least one example of quantitative and one of qualitative, or maybe a couple more. So you could do like suggestion cards, um, surveys. Um, why are suggestion cards better? Because they're anonymous, you know, things like that. Um, questionnaire, you know. Interviews and focus groups you can talk about as qualitative research. Um, about that they're much more in depth. They're able to bring in anecdotes. They're able to. They they can also go off and sort of raise other issues as well. So have a little think about that. You might want to write more on 3.1 than all of them actually. I don't mind how you balance it out as long as you keep it within your 800 words. As I said. 3.2, you don't need to write a lot. You just need to say, who are these people? Maybe just a line of explanation of who they are. OK, don't just give me a list. Don't just give me a list from the chart. Just at least write something about them. Evaluate strategies. We've just had a look at that. But, you know, there's the five strategies I gave you. Just do a little evaluation of them, you know, are they good? Are they not so good? Are they OK? Yeah. Are they detailed enough? Um, think about the things I said. Most of those strategies will have to be transformed into new policies. Generally, for safety or as part of the client safety policy that you might have. OK, so you do need to say something like that. Do have a look at the NHS one. They've got loads of strategies. <clears throat> and, and again, you can pick any one of those out, but please don't forget to cite and reference the document if you've used it from that. Um, and you can Google some as well. You might find some it, you know, a bit more interesting, really. Please do that. But remember, you're not really focused. You're not talking about strategies for general quality. You're only really focusing a strategy that's for the service user's safety. So it's really clear about safety. Yeah. If you're not sure, you can WhatsApp me. Um, so that's it, really. 800 words for that one. And that's that's the end of that one. OK.
So task one, task two, task three, look at the command verbs, um, break it up accordingly. I think it's fairly straightforward, this unit. Bearing in mind that you've done level three and level four, because we have looked at a lot of these things in a great deal more detail. So 3.2, if you're going to identify stakeholders, give me one line at least about what stakeholders are and then identify them with a little line about who you mean, really. Or give me an example in your local community, for example, from your care home, really, if you want. So, OK, support group. So you could say service users, meetings, carers, support group, things like that. Yeah. Okay, any questions? You know where I am on the end of the WhatsApp. And please, if you can't meet the deadline, because I know there was some extensions on the last one, quite a lot of extension. So um try to try to keep try to keep to time, but if you really feel you're gonna need an extension, please, please, please ask beforehand, not one day or two days beforehand ask a week or so beforehand halfway through if you know you're going to struggle with it or if something happened obviously if something happens um like you have to go to hospital or something well that's fine these things aren't predicted just let us know and we'll deal with it accordingly we generally will give you an extension but um some of you are forgetting to send your formal request to uh the college as well as me um, so do your formal request to the college, send it to me. I'll probably the one who recommend the extension to them anyway. So, um, but don't forget to send it to both of us because that's what you should be. That's the process. They need to have your request on file um, when the um, awarding body comes in and they do their inspection. They need to see all the paperwork, really. OK, everybody. So good luck with that. And I will see you again when I do your next unit. Okay. Good luck. Bye.